quantum systems and quantum information. So, well, uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, Olympia and all the organizers of this conference for letting me talk and for the rest of the invited speakers to come here and listen to this talk. So, uh, so uh, uh, the, the next thing that I want to mention is that Leonardo, uh, unfortunately, had uh, familiar problems uh, and he, he couldn't come here. He was part of the discussions of all of this. So, so, uh, so uh, the, this talk uh, I will separate it in, in, in two parts. Uh, everything will be related to the debate about what is going to be information if you can give meaning to this to the fact of this slide. And after many years the debate still goes on and it is unsolved. That, that's one first of the operation. On, on the first part of the talk, we will discuss a mathematical framework of, of the generalized information theory, and probability theory will play a central role on it, so we will spend a lot of time speaking about probabilities. That's for the first part. Then for the second, we will question about the ontology of the possible models satisfying the difference in the different instances of this formalism. And especially, we will ask which is the specific role played by quantum mechanics in all this setting. So, <clears throat> uh, in the origins of information theory, according to Shannon, in his seminal paper, he mentions explicitly that he is going to continue, to continue the, the works of Nyquist and Harde, and in part, he is going to try to incorporate the statistical structure of the original message. So probabilities will play, will play a key role in his setting. And independently of the interpretation that you give to probabilities, one can accept that it is possible to give a mathematical rigorous formulation of probability theory using Kolmogorov's actions. Kolmogorov's actions give a measure on a sigma algebra, which is in particular a Boolean algebra, to the interval 0, 1, satisfying this three actions here. Most of the important things of probability theory can be derived out of this. And, but what happens with quantum mechanics? Uh, this this uh, quote of Feynman will be very important for us. Uh, let us see which, what, what does Feynman mean by probability. He says, when I say that the probability of a certain outcome of an experiment is P, I mean the conventional thing. That is, if the experiment is repeated many times, one expects that the fraction of those which give the outcome in question is roughly p. So he says the usual thing. We repeat identical topics of the those experiment, and so we, we shall check the relative frequency of the outcome. In that sense, there's no uh, fundamental difference with the, the, with the classical case. The, the probability of a classical proposition can be taken just as the same. But Feynman continues and says, what is changed, and changed radically, is the method of calculating these probabilities. And this, this can be clearly seen in, this, uh, in these actions, because, for example, Kolmogorov actions relate the value of the probability of a given proposition and the probability of its negations, of its negation. And, for example, here you have the, the, the relationship between the probabilities of the disjunction of the of the set of propositions and the and you can compute it as the sum of the probabilities of the given uh, assertions or events. So these rules give us uh, the way to compute new probabilities out from all probabilities. So what what is the thing that changes radically in quantum mechanics? Uh, it is very interesting an interpretation of the of the Feynman's quote, which is made by Fuchs and, and Schack in this article. They say the concept of probability is not altered in quantum mechanics in Feynman's sense, but what, what and, and they say it is personalistic bias in probability. But they say what is radical is the receipt it gives for calculating new probabilities from all. 
So let us see what is the thing that changes in quantum mechanics. So why, why does quantum mechanics change radically uh, how we can compute, how the receipt for computing probabilities out of all changes radically? These are von Neumann's actions. These actions give, give the probability for any uh, empirical event in quantum mechanics. If we know that if we have a given event, for example, observing spin up, or that the, the energy of a particular uh, atom is, gives a certain value, this, this will be represented by projection operators. And so events in quantum mechanics are represented by projection operators. But projection operators are organized in an orthomodular structure. They form an orthomodular lattice of propositions. And these actions, despite its, its similarity to, to that of those of Kolmogorov, are very different because this lattice is non-distributive, it's non-boolean, it's a non-boolean algebra. So why is this a correct way of formalizing uh, probabilities in quantum mechanics? Why does this work? That is because of Gleason's theorem. There's no escape. If you believe in the Born rule, if you, if you think that this works in experiments, there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between these measures and density matrices defining these kind of measures. So there is no escape. These are the right actions for uh, at least formulating in a mathematical way the, the, the probabilities in quantum mechanics. So what you see, again, you have the, a result for computing prob new probabilities out from all probabilities. For example, if you know the probability of a given event, then you know how to compute the one of its negation. But in quantum mechanics, the, the negation of a proposition will be the orthogonal complement, and not just the set theoretical complement or the logical classical negation. And if you want to compute, you, you, you have a pairs, a denumerable family of pairs orthogonal projections, then you can compute. But now, the, the notion of pairs orthogonal, of exclusive proposition, will be given by orthogonality. So, despite the similarities between the axiomatics, they are very different, just because this is a, a non-Boolean algebra and the other one is a Boolean algebra. So now, <coughs> but, but the important thing, and the thing that, which allows us to connect all of these abstract structures with experience, is that any orthomodular lattice can be decomposed as a kind of sum of all its maximal Boolean algebras. And what does this mean? This means that in quantum mechanics, we have complementarity. If, if I build an experimental setup here in the table, I will have a Boolean algebra of all its possible results. But if I build another complementary setup, I will have a new Boolean algebra. And these Boolean algebras are related. They are pasted together, forming an orthomodular lattice. Each maximal Boolean subalgebra represents, at least in principle, a possible experimental setup. And an important thing is that a state, a quantum state, given by, by a density matrix and thus via Gleason's theorem, a measure on the lattice, on the total lattice, when we restrict this, this state to a particular experiment, to a particular Boolean algebra, we will recover a Kolmogorovian probability. So for each particular experiment, we have a Kolmogorovian probability. But then a quantum state could, a state could be considered as a family, as an infinite family of Kolmogorovian probability measures. But this, these probability measures are not arbitrary. They are just pasted in a coherent way. And the coherency is given by these actions or equivalently by Born's rule. So we said that there's no magic here. There's no quantum logical reasoning here. It's just classical logic. but taking into account that nature can present, can, may need of different and incompatible uh, empirical context in order to completely define a, a, an object or study or characterize an object. If you want to determine a quantum state, you, must, you are obliged to measure it on different, uh, uh, different uh, 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 non-compatible non non uh, experimental setups. So, so, 
what happens for the qubit? Let us see how this works without too much mathematics. Uh, and a particular experiment should, should be to measure its, its spin in a given direction, represented by a projecting operator P. So this is the, the diagram of the two-element Boolean algebra. And this is the, the diagram of the skeleton of the projection lattice of operators for the two-dimensional Hilbert space. For example, if you choose a direction represented by a projection operator Q, then this, this 0, Q, 1, not Q and 0, will form a two-dimensional Boolean algebra. And the quantum states define a classical or Kolmogorovian probability here. But if you take another different one, you will have a new Kolmogorovian probability here. And they are all pasted together in a coherent way. Well, something completely similar occurs for a three-dimensional Hilbert space. I'm not going into detail because it is just the same, but now with three element Boolean algebra and so on, growing the dimensional dimensionality of the of the model. So a quantum state defines a Kolmogorovian probability distribution on each, each maximal Boolean subalgebra of an orthomodular lattice. Uh, and, and something completely analogous occurs for generalized con contextual models. I'm going to speak about this uh, in a minute. But these Kolmogorovian measures are pasted together in a coherent way. Force rule or von Neumann actions gives coherency to this kind of uh, pasting, which has, which has uh, well, uh, so, so remember, remember now Fuchs, Sack, Feynman observation. They, they, they are saying, you see, what, what, what is, has changed radically is that you have a new receipt for computing new probabilities out from all. Yes, and what has changed radically? What has changed is that, that you must acknowledge complementarity. You have, complementar you have to use complementary observables for experiments. So now, these uh, actions can be generalized. You can start, this L could be a Boolean algebra, could be the lattice of projections in a Hilbert space, or could be a, a, the lattice of a type 2 factor, type 3 factor. There are many models satisfying this, which are of physical relevance. He mentioned uh, the sister algebras in, in quantum field theory. Well, you have a different probability theory to them to that of Kolmogorov and to that of quantum, which is the one which occurs if, if we, we consider algebras of quantum field theory, which will be type 3 uh, algebras. So, uh, but we can tell more. We can say more about this. So, Articles developed an approach which, in a nutshell, says that if a rational agent deals with the Boolean algebra of assertions, representing physical events, a plausibility calculus, calculus can be derived in such a way that the plausibility function yields a theory which is formally equivalent to that of Kolmogorov. So he says, if, if, if you are dealing with, I remember Christopher kicking the wall and saying, this is an event. So if the events, if you organize them or you assume that they can be organized as a Boolean algebra, then there's no there are not, not too many possibilities. You cannot escape. You must use Kolmogorov probability theory. But we have shown that a, a similar result holds if you acknowledge that you must use complementary descriptions of the quantum system. So if you if you know that that you cannot restrict to just Boolean algebra, but you need a coherent pasting of these families, and you assume that that in a quantum case, then you will recover quantum probabilities. Quantum probabilities in the sense of, of von Neumann's actions. So this is uh, the, this discussion is presented in, in this article. So now the the philosophy of all of this will be: so you have a theory, and if the theory is well behaved, you will have a lattice. And if you have a lattice, you will be a well-behaved lattice. You will be able to to recover. The, the, the skeleton or the structure of the probability theory underlying these, these theories and, and probabilities lead you to complex sets to any model or at least the, 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 the most important theories that we, we have available nowadays can be represented as, as complex sets so uh, but what about information? What, the, what, what is the role played by information in all this scheme? So in God's approach, 
Shannon's information measure relies on the axiomatic structure of column over and probability. Cox conjectured that probability uh, that, that Shannon's measure could be derived out of the Boolean structure. And other people, uh, mainly new, but I'm not maybe just to hear, there are others involved. They continue the program and they, they, they give a proof that in a natural way you can introduce Shannon's measure as a natural measure for a Boolean algebra. But, but what happens if we replace a Boolean algebra for a more general algebra? Uh, well, we can show that you, 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 recover, you recover the von Neumann entropy as a natural measure, measure for, the von, for, for the orthomodular lattice of projected operators. So, as we can see, there is a link between the, the, the mathematical structure of probability theory, the, which is related to the, the, the algebraic structures that, of the events that we are going to, to deal with when we gamble. And, 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 and this, uh, to a great extent, determines the, the, the nature of the information involved. Uh, I mean, the, of, the, of the measures of information that you are going to use naturally. Of course, you, you can use many other measures. So here is the, the, the general picture. In classical, you have Shannon. In quantum, you will have von Neumann. And in the general case, you can use measurement entropy, which is a natural generalization of this two. So this, 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 this will be us. This will be uh, how we look. Uh, when, when we, so if someone just assumes that the world or the events that he is going to face when he gambles with life can be represented just as a Boolean algebra, so this, this is what, what we have, just one single probability distribution with a common value measure. That's, uh, that's all. But unfortunately, these organisms are extinct because we know about quantum mechanics, so we need something else. We need, <laughs> <laughs> we need more. So for each Boolean algebra, which represents an empi empirical setup, we will have a probability distribution. And the quantum states organizes all of these probabilities, classical probabilities distributions, in a coherent way. And then, in our little minds, we use von Neumann's entropy as a measure of information. So. <clears throat> That this is how we look when we recognize the importance of contextuality and complementarity. So, <clears throat> from this perspective, it is not uh, not so crazy if we, we now we, we now uh, see what happens in a quantum case. Von Neumann's measure appears as a natural generalization of Shannon's measure, and, and, and from this perspective, to measure Stolling theory will be the natural non-Boolean version version of Shannon's theory. So, uh, that, uh, well, okay. so I, I talked about convex sets. Everybody, everybody here knows what a convex set is. But uh, the, the, the philosophy behind all of these and, and, and more general approaches, which do not involve lattices, is that any probabilistic theory that, that we are going to study can be represented by a convex set. A convex set and each point in the convex sets represents a possible probabilistic state of the, of the theory. So maybe quantum gravity is here, and we don't know. Of course, there are a lot, really a lot of, of complexes. And, and we should look for the principles in order to isolate theories. For example, uh, Adam uh, expressed the importance of determining general principles in order to singularize quantum mechanics out of all, of, all, all possible models. But in general, if you have a classical theory, the, the convex set will be a polytope, something which looks like a tetrad, just to fix ideas. Think about the classical theory as a tetrad. And the faces of the, the sides of the tetrad, uh, they form a lattice, and this lattice is isomorphic to a Boolean algebra. But not all, all, convex, not, not all models are polytopes. In quantum mechanics, here, and on the right you have the qubit, and on the left you have uh, a classical coin. So you have the, the classical bit here and the, and the qubit on the right. So uh, the, the, the probability model is just a line segment, which is a particular case of a polytope. And it, its faces are isomorphic to a two-valued Boolean algebra. 
but the qubit is something much more complicated. It has a coin on each dimension of the space, and it forms a sphere. Well, the, the geometry of the qubit is simple. I mean, everybody knows how to treat the sphere, but as the dimensionality of the Hilbert space grows, the, 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 the geometry of the convex set becomes much more complex, and there is no general theory about this. I mean, you have you know how, how to build a, a quantum state, a quantum set of states, but there's no general characterization of, of this set. But one important remark is that if you look at the faces of the of a quantum set of states, of a convex quantum set of states, these faces will form a lattice which is isomorphic to the uh, propositional lattice of von Neumann. So the, the, the lattice of projected operators is related to the geometry of the convex sets of states. So using algebraic, uh, algebraic uh, properties, you can somehow ch characterize quantum mechanics. So, <clears throat> and, and this is very important because the, the communicational context involves correlations between two different agents. So Alice will try to send a message to Bob, and Bob will try to recover it. But these probabilities live in a, in a, in a convex set which has been discussed in this conference before. So the, the characterization of all of this is related to what happens in, in the communicational context. An important thing as, is that we have a, an informational notion for, for classical mechanics, and so we have a notion of information for quantum mechanics, at least in a mathematical way, up to now. But, but you can say more. There are, there are more uh, research made on this, this set, and, and you can speak about generalized information theory in generalized probabilistic models, which are neither quantum, neither classical. So uh, from, from my point of view, there is a clear sense, at least in a mathematical and operational way, in which we can speak about the generalized information theory. But, If I were just a Bayesian or, or suggestive probability, probability guy, I would say, well, I end up here. That's all I need. Provided that I believe, or, or, or I, uh, I assume that uh, the, the, the events that I'm going to face in a particular ex experiment are not reduced to a Boolean natural. So we have, I make this simple assumption, which is uh, completely reasonable for me, I can end up here and say, well, I have the rules to gamble even when I cannot reduce everything to Boolean algebra. But what about ontology? We would like to see what, what's beyond that. I mean, or, or at least it is an, an interesting philosophical discussion. Uh, uh, so what about the ontological commandments of this theory? So in which sense do we speak about information when we code something using qubits? Or is it possible to interpret a general stream of qubits somehow as a message? Well, if, if these bits are coded in, a, in an orthonormal basis, we, could, we will recover a classical notion of information, whatever it is. But if, if when, I, when I code the qubits in a, in a non-orthonal non -orthonal state, the question is subtle, as, as Olympia remarked. And, uh, of course, there, there was a lot of debates, debates uh, around this in this conference. So there are many attempts to give meaning to this uh, to this problem. How to how to give a communicational or informational uh, non-deflationary view of, of, of a general string of qubits? How how to consider it as a piece of uh, as as containing information? in a more ontological way. So in this reference, uh, Ren has proposed an interesting uh, definition of quantum information. And he says, quantum information can be regarded as a kind of combination of two types of classical information, which is related to the result of measuring two complementary observables. So I'm not going to to, to the detail of this, but I want to call the attention on it, because it is important, because it means that there are people working in a complete sense on elaborating these ideas. And, and he has a, a good perspective, I think. Uh, and at the same time, uh, uh, Sheffield Bach, in this paper, 
provides a, a quantum logical interpretation of, of the, the computational algorithms in quantum mechanics. So maybe quantum logic can do something in order to, to give meaning to uh, uh, an interpretation of information. Uh, there is also Dimson's way. We can we could follow it that way. We will start discussing this workshop. I know that you mentioned. I want to concentrate on this one, not because I adhere to it, uh, but the, the features that it has uh, are important for me for for giving a foundation to a, a physicalistic physicalist uh, interpretation of of information. So, in in this article, Deutsch and Ecker which is uh, in a book of, in, in 2000, they, they start with analyzing a kind of qubit like this. Uh, I mean, th these are three qubits in a superposition state. And as you see, this special state contains all possible combinations of information of three bits. So somehow, they say, everything is encoded here at the same time. And when you run the computer, uh, when you run the computation, you do it all at once. If you want to make the, the same computation using classical bits, you need to run the computer eight times in order to get the, the eight results. But in this case, you have everything there. Of course, it is inaccessible. You cannot get into all the information at once. But let us go into the details. They say that those quantum theory, that we, because they say somehow in a state, you have seven several different words, alternative words, which coexist uh, one beside the other, and they cooperate via the coherent superposition. So quantum theory describes an enormously larger reality than the universe we observe around us. It turns out that this reality has the approximate structure of multiple variants of that universe, coexisting and affecting each other only through interference phenomena. But for the purposes of this article, all we need of these parallel universes, ontology, is the fact that we see as a single particle, what we see as a single particle is actually one tiny aspect of a tremendously complex entity, the rest of which we cannot detect directly. Quantum computation is about making the invisible aspect of the particle, its counterparts in other universes, work for us. So, you can adhere to this or not, but this is an ontological claim. They are saying the world is made of this stuff, and this stuff is such and such as these properties. And these properties are fundamental. So information somehow plays a fundamental role in the ontological structure of reality. So uh, now, in, in, the, in the following article of the same book, Yosef explains us that this is our principle of local operations. A single local unitary operation and subsystem on a large entangled system processes the embodied information by an amount which will generally require an exponential effort to represent in classical computational terms. In the sense noted above, n qubits have exponentially larger capacity to represent information than n classical bits. However, the potentially vast information embodied in a quantum state has a further remarkable feature. Most of it is inaccessible to being read by any possible means. But then he continues, and this, this is the important part. The full, largely inaccessible information content of a real quantum state is called quantum information. He leaves a precise definition of quantum information, which is ontological from my perspective. And, and, and natural, natural quantum physical evolution may be thought of as processing of quantum information. He says, let us consider quantum evolutions as some, some, some kind of process which is a processing of information. Thus, the viewpoint of computational complexity reveals a new bizarre distinction between classical and quantum physics to perform natural quantum physical evolution. Nature must process vast amount of information at the rate that cannot be matched in real time by any classical means. Yet at the same time, most of this processed information is kept hidden from us. However, he remarks, it is possible to, to manage uh, in order to, to gain some, uh, so to harness nature in order to solve particular computational problems. So the next observation, which is related to this, is that they, they, they are suggesting that at the ontological level, quantum mechanics and classical mechanics are very different because 
Uh, there, there is an extended uh, version of the church telling thesis, metaphysicists. So, and, and they say that every finitely realizable physical system can be simulated arbitrarily closely by a universal model computing machine operating by finite means. So, roughly this is saying that with a classical computer, I would be able to, to model in a realistic time and resources any kind of physical evolution. So what Yosa is saying in the, in the last slide is that if all of this is true, classical computers cannot model uh, uh, quantum evolution. So there, there is a radical difference between quantum mechanics and classical mechanics. And, and this, this difference is ontological because it relies on the nature of quantum evolution. It is intrinsic. So you are saying the world is made of quantum systems, and quantum systems are like that, they evolve like that, they process information like this and like this. So it is a, a metaphysical structure going on here. So <clears throat> that there is a possibility that, that the universal Turing machine and hence all classical computers might, might not be able to simulate some of the behavior to be found in nature. Conversely, it may be physically possible not ruled out but by the laws of nature, to realize a new type of computation essentially different from, from that of classical computer science. And up to now, all that we know suggests that all of this is true. I mean, just these this facts, not necessarily the interpretation that these people are providing. So, <clears throat> so there is indeed a physicalist approach. We have seen an, some examples, and you, you can also say that uh, information can be naturally transmitted, stored, processed, and, and so the content of a physical string of non-orthogonal qubits will be just its operational computational task in the particular context that it is used. A world made of robotic machines, for example, a world without us, could communicate perfectly well using qubits. Notice that now the notion of communication is enriched in order to involve more general tasks, such as control, etc. So, I mean, these robots could live in a, in a big world which is a quantum computer by itself and the task of a given robot is just to process quantum information. So there is a, a physical notion. But, but my, my point of view, my claim is that all of these proposals are not enough. More work has to be done in order to find a caution ontological interpretation. Sorry, before we go on, was that on the previous slide, was that what you're calling the physicalist approach supposed to be different from what I said? What? Is, is this supposed to be different from what I said? The, the last sentence, no. And the whole, the whole. No, no, the whole is. Uh, okay, because so I would say that that doesn't look to me as if it's different from what I said. Okay. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> um, but, uh, but I think that you agree with the last one. Okay. Sure. sure. Yeah. And, and oh, uh, this one also, also this one. Yeah. But you you do not agree with this one. Right? With which one? With this one. Sure. With the Yosa. Yeah, well, we'll, we'll have to come back to that. Yeah. You, That's right, so I don't agree. You don't agree. Yeah. Neither are. So, yes, of course. I think that, yeah, I mean, your option is, is rational and it's valid. <laughs> and, <laughs> but, but also, there's a kind of rationality inside of Yosa's proposal and Deutsch. I mean, what I mean is that more work has to be done in order to exploit all of this for further development. Yeah. You see that? I, I think that the a pluralistic approach is what, what is at stake here. So, uh, well, uh, so, but, but what's the role played by quantum mechanics in all of this? Is quantum mechanics really necessary to implement the formalism of quantum information processing? So, in which sense? And, and which ontologies are compatible with the formal framework? So, let us see some examples. First, uh, this is an old discussion, of course. Uh, Popescu uh, showed that there are quantum states which do not violate Bell inequalities, but are suitable for implementing the teleportation protocol with a reasonable fidelity. So that, that's a result. But these states then admit a lot of, a lot of hidden variable interpretation. So they can be somehow considered classical. Not completely classical, of course. But uh, so, the, so, well, uh, and th there are other examples. Uh, one of the main features of quantum information is contextuality. Another one is, is uh, non-locality. So how to model these features using classical systems? 
In this article, there is a proposal of a, of a ball standing on the surface of a sphere, and, and the state of the ball will be just the direction in which it is uh, uh, deposited, and a measurement will be given by choosing an arbitrary direction, say u, and putting a, a elastic band along, along the diagonal of the sphere. And then the measure will be the, the ball just falls perpendicularly here, it gets stacked sphere, and then the, the elastic band cuts, breaks, uh, in a un with uniform probability in some place. And for example, if it breaks on this side, the ball just goes to this point, and so it jumps from state B to U. And if, if it goes here, it's from to B, goes to B, to minus U. So the end of the story is that when you compute the probabilities here, you will recover a qubit model. So this is a silly or a toy model of what will be a simulation of a quantum system. So this simulates contextuality. You can also speak about, about uh, mixed states here. And if you use rigid roads in order to, to relate the particles, I mean classical, non-local rigid roads, you can simulate also entanglement. So from a mathematical point of view, this is a quantum system. But in reality, it is not. But because of its mathematical pro properties, it satisfies all the requirements of a, of a, of a quantum information processing. But you may say, no, this example is too artificial. Nobody is trying to, no, of course, nobody is going to, to <laughs> make further developments on this. But I, I will show you more and more realistic classical examples. And so, for example, in a series of papers, these authors presented kind of bombs in droplets, which are, which are uh, you have a liquid, and, and these are drops of, of the liquid which do not coalesce. They, they start bouncing, they, they stand bouncing at the surface of the water. And these, these bouncing droplets provide a classical model of a particle interacting with its pilot wave. So I, I'm going to show you some videos, so if you believe me. But there's already an interpretational paper on this. And this is a classical model which resembles somehow quantum mechanics. So this, uh, this is the, the, the wave generate the, the ball bounces and generate waves. And then the ball, the complex dynamics arises and the, and the, the drop, droplet interacts with the waves that it, it generates. And, and this is, well, this of course will not work. Uh, yeah, my videos, they don't work here. So I will, I will just show you the video. No, it's working. It's working. No, nah, it's working because I... <laughs> so look. You see? It's working. Here, here, here comes these walkers. You put a, a wall on them and they interact. And when, when you register the statistics of, of where they do they scatter, you will recover uh, a kind of interference pattern. So this is a classical model of a pilot wave in a concrete sense. So in a... So now, uh, now, ah, a couple of days ago, uh, one of the authors of, of four of these papers said uh, in Nature something like, "This does not prove that pilot waves exist in the quantum realm." Caution for, but it does show how an atomic scale pilot wave might work. We were told that such effects cannot happen classically, he says, and here we are showing that they do. So you have concrete models, and, and, but you may say, oh, nobody is going to try to develop quantum algorithms using this model. So maybe you don't like this example, but you can go to more concrete examples, and, and these have been largely studied in the literature. Uh, you can simulate quantum systems using classical uh, electromagnetic waves. So it has been established that using classical optical waves, it is possible to simulate the behavior of quantum computers. A possible strategy to, to do this for a system of n qubits is to consider the profile of the classical electric field amplitude in a laser beam, which is complex, as the analog of the probability, am, probability amplitude of a quantum state. But I, I will tell you the end of the story right now. The, the, the story does not have a good end, because, of course, as we expected, 
uh, this kind of simulation is high efficient since it requires a number of classical resources that scales exponentially with the number of quantum bits being simulated. And this is not just a technical, uh, a, a pragmatical problem. It has to do with the very nature of quantum evolution. It has to do with the violation of charge Turing, uh, the extended charge Turing test. So there's a metaphysical difference, important metaphysical one, between quantum mechanics and, and, and these classical uh, imitations. So, there are a, a, a lot of, well, you start with a laser and you have two possible outcomes. If this go here, uh, uh, two slits, and if it goes here, you will say zero, and if it goes here, you say one. And then you manage to transform the light using ratings and lenses in order to apply the Hadamard operator and phase transformations and so on. So, you implement quantum logical com computational gates. So <clears throat> there are a lot of articles and ex empirical experimental <laughs> devices, uh, but they, they all end up uh, concluding the same. Uh, for example, here they say the drawback of this technique is clearly the exponential increase of the resources optical devices with the size of the circuit. Uh, but nevertheless, as optical components that simulate one and two qubit universal uh, a non-trivial quantum computing optical device can easily be constructed if the number of component qubits is not too large. Well, all, all the examples end up in the same way that they fail uh, to, be, to, to implement uh, an efficient quantum computation, but they are a model, notwithstanding. So, uh, well, I'm not going to in the details of all of this, but you have here a lot of references. You can check, check them by yourselves. You have also simulation of various inequalities and so on. So, which are the preliminary ontological conclusions of all of this? And the classical analogs cannot replace the EPR Rosen, the, the EPR type experiments, nor can be used to build efficient quantum computers. Uh, so, but notice that in a world governed by Newtonian mechanics, non local correlations could be reproduced. Because if we really have really rigid roads in the world or, or non-local interactions, we could mimic quantum non-locality and quantum contextuality. So Newton could have conceived and developed a quantum computer if the world would have been really Newton. Of course, it is not. Uh, but then, at the metaphysical level, this is one of the preliminary conclusions, quantum information processing does not require quantum mechanical models. So you can do that, but they will be inefficient. And this inefficiency is due to a, to a very important feature which is characteristic of quantum mechanics. Uh, so uh, so of course, as far as we know, the world is non Newtonian, so nothing of, of this can be implemented. Uh, well, so as, as conclusions, we can say that in classical theories, we deal with events Space is forming Boolean algebras, and in the quantum case and more general models, we deal with contextual or non Boolean event spaces. And as probabilities lie at the heart of information theory, for example in Shannon's version, it is not surprising to find a contextual version of this theory in more general probabilistic models. In particular, we can develop a mathematical version of information theory based on the quantum formalism. And, and, and use Olympia's brackets here, quantum information theory. Because I remain, remain uh, con conservative regarding the interpretation of the notion of quantum information by itself alone. So one may conjecture that there is an information theory for each family of probabilistic models. For example, in, in quantum mechanics, in startup quantum mechanics, we have type 1 algebras, but when you jump into quantum mechanics of continuous degrees of heat freedom, such as field theory or, or statistical mechanics, type 2 and type 3 factors may appear, and they give rise to different uh, probabilistic models. And then you will have a different uh, information theory. So, but, but it comes the question, what lies behind this mathematical formalism? Which are the ontological correlates of these probabilistic models, including the quantum one? So can we speak consistently of quantum information? We have seen attempts and examples which are really interesting 
but there is still too much work to be done in this direction in order to achieve the caution ontological meaning. So an important step in this direction is to clarify the role of classical models of quantum information in all this setting. We have seen that in many senses it is possible to conceive models which embrace a classical ontology, but from the formal point of view present quantum features. These features make them acceptable as models of quantum informational formalisms. We have presented several examples. Uh, so the existence of these models seems to point in the direction that there is no quantum commitment in the formalism of quantum information theory. Quite on the contrary, to deal with concrete quantum systems need not to be necessary at all in order to cope with the more important features of QIT. But, notwithstanding, with a very low probability, <laughs> No, no. The, the, the above considerations do not imply that the technological developments based on quantum systems are useless. Quite on the contrary, they con constitute the intended interpretation of the formalism and are up to now the only known candidates practically available for realizing the formalism in an efficient way, offering a host of promising technologies. The origin of this peculiar feature of QM, I mean, by this I mean that it cannot be if this is true, but modeled by classical computers, lies at the very heart of quantum mechanics and relies on irreconcilable ontological differences with classical mechanics. So, thanks uh, for your attention. These are several references of classical models of quantum information. This is a references of uh, generalized information theory. And these are some of our papers on the on, on, on this. And still, the, the papers that I mentioned here. So, thank you. Thanks. We have just over 10 minutes for questions before lunch. And Alan? Uh, what do you mind about the uh, take your uh, approach ontology? Yeah? What do you don't like about the origin of the ontology? There's an ontology. I don't, I don't like multiple words. Yes. Do you have an answer? I mean, you, uh, you make a request. Yes. If you have an answer, everything fits. I <coughs> just don't, don't like it. I want you to express why you don't. Yeah, I don't like to believe in parallel universe. I don't like them. They are too uh, inaccessible and too difficult, difficult to manage from an empirical point of view. But it's a matter of metaphysical taste. I don't know how to reject it. Maybe the philosophers have more. Uh, deeper criticisms, but I, I, put, I, I choose that example because I think that it is a clear example of, a, of an interpretation of quantum information in which interpretation is a feature which relies uh, as an ontological, a deep ontological feature of reality. So I, I consider it as a valid example. I do not adhere to the interpretation, but I consider it a possible one. That, so just picking up on this example, I, why is it that um, you think we need to have an interpretation of information which tells us something about the fundamental you know, features of reality and makes a really deep commitment there? Um, I, I, I'm not sure. What's the motivation for that? Because, uh, I mean, I think one of the advantages the way that uh, Chris and I think about information is that the kind of interpretation we have, we think is perfectly logically consistent, and it's compatible with a vast array of different ways that the world could be. So the question is, you know, if, if the theory doesn't somehow force you to make a commitment, and the kinds of explanatory roles or advantages um, that your, your particular interpretation have, um, you know, are, are just as good whether we fill that stuff in or don't. I mean, why not just step back and say, we don't actually need to specify any of this in order to have a reasonable interpretation. And that's a, that's a massive virtue for this way of thinking about information. Well, I'm going to answer you using a similar example, uh, which should be our attitude to physics. I could stand just on an operational standpoint and say, 
I don't want to know what, what this is about. I don't want to know about any further, further uh, metaphysical or ontological features of the world, but only concentrate on the things that I can touch, events. I could adopt, for example, a, a subjectivist approach and remain agnostic about what is going on beyond in the transcendent uh, world. Uh, that's a possibility. But it turns out that interpretation of quantum mechanics and interpretation of physical theories in general plays a key role in the development of physics. When you start to interpret, when you, you start to give ontological explanations, problems arise. Problems pop out but because it, this is my proposal, so I criticize it, and then we try to measure if your proposal is wrong or right. And so this kind of game, which physicists usually do, even if they say that they don't do that, they, they do that every day, every time. So I think that it is very important. And the, the task of the philosophy of quantum mechanics, or, or the people who is working on the interpretation of quantum mechanics, is to play this game and use all the possible, to, to choose all the, pick up all the possibilities and try to find new problems out of the old ones. So for example, look at, look at the, 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 the words of Sean Bell. They are very important. Nowadays they are very important. But he said, uh, he said well, I want to know if there really exists a, a local hidden variable explanation of quantum correlations. He could re just remain silent and say, well, there are just correlations. What the hell do I care about the, the non-local variables? That's a possibility. And it's a, well, I mean, it's, it's good. But his work and his metaphysical lambda questions gave rise to one of the most important subjects or uh, fields of research in the last, I don't know, uh, 50 years. Uh, so I think that, uh, for example, I don't like uh, 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 Eckert and Josa and the addition of these many words, at least in those papers. But maybe out of that interpretation, we can pose new problems, and maybe some of them can be made uh, into the lab and test new things, and that's, that's the way I yeah. think things. So um, two, two things come to mind. One, um, I have no uh, problem with the game of interpreting quantum mechanics. I think it's a, a nice game to play, and uh, I think we've learned a lot about taking seriously certain kinds of ways the world could be. That's great. Uh, what I don't understand is um, why that game has to be routed through a concept of information. Um, and if you're going to say, well, um, it might be useful heuristically, um, that's fine with me, but I, I don't think, as a philosopher, my job is to give heuristics uh, to physicists. I tend to think, if, if that's the only thing you're trying to do, then there's absolutely no constraints whatsoever. Um, if an idea is useful, fantastic, great. Um, but I take it, um, it, at least what I try to do is uh, do a lot more than just you know, toss out an idea which might be useful to somebody in some context. Um, there's a certain kind, you know, there's, there are just desiderata which make certain kinds of interpretations better than others. Um, and a lot of it, I think, has to do with you know, what do you need in order to affect successful explanations? What do you need in order to, you know, understand how the theory can possibly be successful? And then, of course, just, you know, <laughs> is this logically coherent? Um, so, I, I think I disagree quite a bit with uh, the notion of what interpretation is supposed to do. Well, I, I agree with you. The test of the philosoph philosopher is usually very different to that of the working physicist. Uh, maybe you are interested, maybe, in, in developing uh, a metaphysical system of the world, maybe. Or maybe you want to do some Kantian philosophy, I don't know. Your, your, you know, your ultimate philosophical inclinations. Some philosophers ask about being. I mean, there are many, plenty, plenty of possibilities inside philosophy itself. When, uh, uh, parenthesis, there is a radical uh, assertion which says uh, informational interpretations of quantum mechanics has no meaning at all. So maybe someone comes and says, 
they have no meaning at all. I don't agree. I think that they have some meaning. There's people trying to do some meaning out of them. So I tell, talked about them in, in, my, in my slides because I think that it is important to acknowledge that they exist. Second thing, I do not adhere to an interpretation of information and interpretation of quantum mechanics. I would search in another direction. Of course, I, uh, I agree with you that you are not just playing a game here. We are not just playing a game and we are trying to, to, to search for which is the best interpretation or at least if that is not possible because uh, an intrinsic uh, pluralism inside physical theories, which is a philosophical issue by itself, uh, but, but we, we, our work should be to try to see which are the advantages and the disadvantages of each, each interpretation and try to find as an objective the best interpretation of quantum mechanics. Uh, so I don't see that I am so far away from you. I'm not saying here that we should, that you are obliged as a philosopher to do this. I'm just saying uh, that this debate is interesting and may enrich your project or the project of any other philosopher. I don't know if I am so which perhaps good. Yeah. Yeah, Olivia has a, a comment. Two minutes and then lunch. <coughs> okay, and a little comment. Uh, regarding what uh, Alan said about ask about parallel universes, if you think that I think that uh, in this case we have lost, we have forgot the difference between actual and potential. It, 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 everything seems to be needs to be actual to be real. And the parallel universes, I mean, the many worlds uh, interpretation, in the many worlds, the parallel universes are actual, are real, actual because they are real. But perhaps somebody can read Deutsch's proposal, I don't know if it is, is, if it is his aim, uh, one can understand the parallel universes as potential, not actual. And, but not le less real, and perhaps if, you, if one understands that there are ways in which computing can be done at the potential of the possibility, the possibility domain, what the actual domain, and then this, this, is, this would be the reality of and in this case, in this case, information would be, I mean, the peculiarity of quantum mechanics is something that, uh, I mean, the quantum mechanics, in quantum mechanics you can store and process information more efficiently, but this does not mean that it is a different nature of inform the information, that quantum information is a different uh, information of a different nature. I mean, perhaps we can understand more, um, I mean, not, not so extravagantly, ontologically extravagantly, the proposal of, uh, of Deutsch. I don't know if it is his position, perhaps. In Maybe if you change that. No, no, but the fact is that in general, people <laughs> think about parallel universes. I mean, uh, many worlds, but the many worlds are all actual. Yeah. Do you want to say something in response to that before we break? Or? No, that's yes, okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, not me, no. Do you want to say anything? No, no. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, that's a change. So it's, no, it hasn't changed its views. I know in that quote, it's possible to have data as well. I don't know what data echoes. Ah, yeah, yeah. You must be careful about reading those kind of joint papers looking for a a, a deep statement of ontology because it's a lightweight intro piece between two people, one of whom has very pronounced uh, commitments in ontology of quantum theory and the other one who I don't know if it's yet or not. No, no, I just picked, picked the, the quotations, uh, but it, in order to do a serious interpretation of Deutsch, I should pick everything that I, I, I did. Anyway, so let's thank Federico. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Remember to eat and chat and drink and then.
Take a nap. Use a drink. I said, not again. <laughs>